All right, good evening. Welcome uh, to our second to the last School of the Bible class tonight uh, here at Maranatha Baptist Church, week number 11. And so we have this week and next week. Now tonight, uh, this will finish up our New Testament survey class. And so next week, we're still having School of the Bible, but we'll only have two classes next week. And so uh, we're stopping at Ephesians because uh, we're running out of books of the Bible. And so we've got to save some for next semester. And so we'll pick up with Philippians in uh, probably August or September uh, when we start back. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to get ready to uh, open in a word of prayer. So remember, if you're watching via live stream tonight, if you'll check in with us, we appreciate that. Uh, and uh, probably around this summer, probably about July or so, uh, we'll be getting you information for uh, next semester. Uh, but I will tell you this, we are going back into the old fellowship hall. We're going back to in-person classes, and we're going to do some things a little bit different. We might stream from the iPad, but we're not going to do it like this. We're getting back into a classroom environment. We're moving full speed ahead here at Maranatha Baptist Church, and so uh, we're, we're ready to get back into class. Uh, uh, you know, I know it's kind of convenient to uh, teach from a camera, but I don't like to teach to an empty sanctuary. So uh, we're going to go back to teaching in a class. Amen. And so uh, we'll, we'll make some kind of means and provisions for those of you who already started. Uh, but next semester, we're going to do some things a little bit different. But anyway, that being said, let's look to Ephesians tonight and see what God would have for us. So let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We ask you to help us, Father, to be with us. We thank you for those who have gathered here today and those who are watching at home. Uh, we ask for a blessing upon them. And Lord, we just pray that, uh, Lord, that people will learn the word of God. They'll be encouraged and strengthened in the things of the Lord. And that's our goal and that's our desire. That's why we do this. So, Father, it's to strengthen our people, to make our church stronger, and, Father, to make our home stronger, and, uh, Father, to just be a light in this darkness. Dark world. So guide us tonight in this rich, wonderful book of Ephesians. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the book of Ephesians here, uh, slide number one. Uh, of course, Paul is the author. This is one of Paul's uh, epistles that he wrote, the 13 epistles Paul wrote. The book of Ephesians, this is probably Paul's most M personal. Uh, you know, we said that 2 Corinthians was probably his most personal heartfelt letter. Uh, this is probably the most impersonal of his letters, but this book of Ephesians is full of church truth, okay? And so we're going to look at some of that tonight and uh, what Paul explains here. And so Paul, when he writes this book, uh, of course, Paul had a, a great connection with uh, uh, those at Ephesus. I think uh, more than any of uh, in his journeys, Paul stayed at Ephesus longer than he did anywhere else, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. I believe it was about three years. And so a uh, pastor, somebody correct me, throw a book at me if that's wrong, but I believe that's right. That, and so he had a, a great connection. Of course, we're reading about in the book of Acts when he goes to Jerusalem that they wept with him because because they would see him again no more. So we had a deep ties with this church at Ephesus. And so Paul's about 65 when he writes uh, this book under the inspiration of God's Spirit. And then while he was imprisoned in Rome, this is one of his prison epistles, uh, he was under house arrest in Rome. And uh, he is writing to the church in Ephesus. But really the book of Ephesus is not so much as just, just written to the, the church at Ephesus, it's written to the whole church, the body of Christ. And Paul gets into a lot of that. And so uh, even though he's sending it to a certain location, Ephesus, it's not just for the church at Ephesus. This book is really to the entire church. Now remember we said uh, that our marching orders today as the church, we get from these, uh, especially these Pauline epistles, the 13 uh, books that Paul penned. That, that's the guidance for us today in this age of grace. Of course, all the New Testament, all the Bibles, uh, uh, there's application for us in all from Genesis to Revelation. But the ones that are specifically written to the church fall in these categories of Paul's epistles and definitely, definitely the book of Ephesians, okay? And so uh, it's written about A.D. 61, so about middle way through the first century uh, is when this is written. It's Paul's greatest prison masterpiece. It's a beautiful book. It's a towering book. And even though it's a short book, I think six chapters, uh, it's a towering book of truth. And there's so much. And it's full of riches. Okay, the next slide, please. The theme of the book is union with Christ, okay? And uh, also, uh, it, it, wealth in Christ and riches in Christ, uh, uh, so much in this book. And so a union with Christ. Number one, it was written to encourage and instruct a young church in a wicked city 
Paul left uh, uh, Ephesus about A.D. 55 or 56, okay? So remember when Paul was at Ephesus, they worshipped the goddess Diana. Remember there's an uproar in the city as uh, Paul was there and Paul did some uh, great works and miracles there in, in Ephesus and Paul came in danger of his own life and had to leave. And so it was a wicked city. They were pagan idol worshippers. But here was a church that was established. There were believers there and uh, there was a stronghold of the faith and now Paul's writing to them, okay? And it's a young church in the midst of a wicked city. So Paul is encouraging them, helping them. Number two, to teach the full truth of the union of Christ by using three illustrations. And so there's three illustrations Paul uses uh, in the book of Ephesians to describe uh, the, our union as believers with Christ. And so here's where the book not just applies only to the Christians at Ephesus, but to all Christians, to the church, the body of Christ. And so the three unions that Paul mentions here, we'll look at a few of these here, a few of these scripture passages. Look in chapter 1, verses 22 through 23. Paul describes our union with Christ as a believer, as a body, okay? And so in verse 22 and 23 of chapter 1, "...and hath put all, all things under his feet, and gave him to the behead over, the, uh, over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him, that filleth all in all." And so the church is a body. And uh, you can read more about that in chapter 4, verses 4 through 16. Uh, Paul talks about the body of Christ. So uh, our union is described with Christ as a body, members together. And he gets into a lot of that, especially in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, talking about that we're members in particular of one body. And so the same truth and the same thought Paul is conveying to these Ephesian elders and to you and I as believers. We're the body of Christ. He's the head. We're the body. Okay, the second union, uh, the description he uses is a building. So the first is a body, the second is a building. And you find that in chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Now, therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye are also builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So our union with Christ is mentioned as a body, but also as a building, okay? And so we're a building, we're, uh, and he's the head cornerstone, he's the head of the body, and he's the head cornerstone of the building, the most important stone in the foundation of the building. Okay, the third aspect that he describes here of our union with Christ is as a bride. So a body, a building, and a bride. You find this in chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. pastor's been uh, teaching out of some of this in his class the last few weeks. And so uh, we're married with Christ. We're married in a union. And so as a, a man and a woman comes together in a, a holy bonds of marriage, they become one flesh, the Bible said, okay? They leave their mothers and fathers and they become one unit together. All right, verse 22 and 23, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. And so we're married. Paul said, I've espoused you to Christ, a chaste virgin to Christ. So the church uh, is the bride of Christ. We're the building of Christ, the body of Christ, and the bride of Christ. And so all those descriptions Paul uses to describe our union or our relationship with him. Never think of yourself apart from Jesus Christ. You are always in him. We're married to him, we're built in him, and uh, then, of course, we're part of his body. So we are one with Christ, all right? The outline here, just a simple outline, our wealth in Christ, chapters 1 through 3, talks about our riches in Christ. Uh, I am in Christ, talks about our unlimited riches. Okay, that's the next slide, I believe, preacher, I'm sorry. And ta uh, talks about God's work for us and as God uh, working in us. And it also talks about our riches in Christ. Uh, of course, I know we're in the book of Ephesians, but look back in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, talking about the riches that we have in Christ. Romans eleven thirty-three: 33, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. And so His 
Riches for the believer is unsearchable, and we can't fathom that. We can't search that. Let's go back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and we'll read a few of these verses that just, uh, we don't have time to do a detailed study on this, but talking about some of these unsearchable riches that we have in Christ. Okay, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. Now, uh, uh, we sing the song, Count Your Blessings, Name Them One by One. As we read these verses, I want you to count your blessings that we have in Christ. Well, He hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Remember, we're sinners. Having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself. Now, that's not speaking of the predestination of the Calvinist. Uh, it's speaking of that, uh, you know, I, I, the best way to explain uh, biblical predestination is that there's a door. And on the, the, the side that we're looking at, it says, Whosoever will can enter that door. And so God's salvation is for whosoever will. But on the back side of that door, it says chosen from the foundation of the world. And so God knows in His foreknowledge who's going to be saved and not. And so God just didn't determine that you and you are going to be saved and the rest of you are going to die and go to hell. The Bible says that God would have all men to be saved. So just a quick word on that. And so He's predestinated us to be the adoption of children. And so what He's talking about being predestined is that God had already ordained or predestined that all of those who would accept Christ as their Savior, they would be adopted in the family of God. In other words, God just didn't go through the human race and pick and choose who He wanted to be saved. God offered His salvation to whosoever will. God enabled man with a free choice. God put man to a test to exercise that choice. He still does today. But the reality is that those who will accept Christ, God has chosen before the foundation of the world that they will be adopted into the family of God if they come by faith in Christ. Okay? So simple word on that. Now verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Are y'all getting these riches so far? Uh, we've done, uh, got a dump truck load and we're just in verse number 6. Look in 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded uh, toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one, that's the body of Christ, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, uh, nated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. So not only did God predestine us to be adopted into the family of God, those who would come by faith, but God has predestined that all those who will come by faith will have an inheritance. In Christ, join heirs with Christ, that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, and whom after you were trust, and whom after you trust, and whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. Okay, and so there are so many blessings in those uh, first few verses up to verse 14. And that's just an introduction to this book. And so the whole book is full of these riches, okay? Uh, therefore, since uh, God works in us, uh, and the first part talks about our riches, and the second part, uh, chapters 4 through 6, talks about our walk in Christ. So our wealth in Christ, the first three chapters, the last three, our walk in Christ. Christ is in me. We have unlimited responsibility, our work for God. So talking about practical Christian application in our life. Some of the... Uh, next slide, please. Key words. The, word, uh, the phrase in Christ is found ten times in this small book. Okay, so that's the emphasis that we're uh, combined or in a union with Christ. Remember, Jesus said, unless we abide in Him, we can do nothing. And so uh, uh, the book of Ephesians is a, a deeper explanation of that. And so in Him appears two times. The word power appears seven times. The words heavenly places appear four times. And the words riches five times. The key verse, of course, we're familiar with Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. And then actually it adds verse 10 here. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we 
should walk in them. So talking about our walk there. Okay, and so that we walk in good. We're not saved by good works, but we continue in good works. Okay, next slide. Special features in this book of Ephesians. Uh, it's been called the Grand Canyon of Scripture. It's broader and deeper than any other book. So it's only six chapters, but there is so much depth. And we read that all oh, the depths of uh, uh, the unsearchable wisdom of God and the grace of His goodness, His unsearchable riches. And, and so we find that definitely uh, in the book of Ephesians. This will be a good book to study, a good book to hunker down in and stay for a while. It would take you a long time to study it properly. Notice two of Paul's great prison prayers, okay? And so Paul prays uh, uh, for enlightenment for them in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Uh, Paul's uh, praying that their eyes be open. In verse 15, Wherefore also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give uh, unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge in Him. Look in verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling, and what is the riches of His glory, of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ, when He hath raised Him from the dead, and set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is come." You know, when we first got saved, you know, we, we got out of hell. That's just the beginning. And Ephesians goes beyond just salvation, the riches that we have in Christ. And, you know, uh, uh, Paul's desire was for them to grow. That's every pastor and preacher's desire for their flock to grow, for their people to grow. Paul had personally led these people to the Lord, and so now he wanted them to grow, to come to this place of knowledge and enlightenment. And he's not talking about crossing your legs somewhere and doing yoga and looking at the sun. That's not what Paul's talking about. Paul's talking about a meditation in the Word of God, that you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ by spending time in His Word. The more you spend time in the Word of God, the more you spend time in classes like these, the more you learn about Christ and, the, and, and, and your eyes become open to the truth of God's Word and you begin to grow in grace and those things. And that's what Paul's desire was, that they come to that place, uh, always seeking to go a, another level in their Christian life. Never get in a rut in your Christian life. Never get satisfied where you're at. Strive every day and every year to go farther in your Christian life than you've been. To go, uh, you know, uh, talking about a higher plane than I've found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And so uh, looking for a higher plane. And so that's definitely what Paul is encouraging. And, 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 and of course the power. He's talking that, that he wants them to access the power. We have all this at our fingertips. The wisdom for life. The power to overcome sin. The power to overcome this world. That, that's all available to the child of God. But sadly, many Christians never tap into these resources because they never grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. So that was Paul's prayer of enlightenment. And then in chapter 3, verses 14 through 21, Paul's prayer of empowerment. And chapter 3 and verse 14, Paul says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to, his, uh, to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. It's in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And so uh, he says that, his prayer for their empowerment. His prayer for their enlightenment, his empowerment. And then, of course, in uh, look in chapter 6, uh, special features here is putting on the armor of God. Paul talks about, of course, this is the practical part of the book. Our everyday Christian life, we're in a battle every day, a spiritual warfare. And so in order to face the enemy, we must put on the armor of God. And so Paul says in chapter 6 and verse, uh, let's read back to verse 10. Finally, my brethren, as he, this is his conclusion to the book, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities, against powers, and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand... Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now look in verse 18. Don't forget verse 18. Uh, most Bibles separate and end the armor in verse 17, but it doesn't end there. It ends in verse 18. Praying, prayer is part of the armor of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, uh, I've always said it like this. In verses uh, 12 through 17, you get the pieces of armor, but in order to uh, attach those pieces, you've got to read verse 18. Prayer is what puts it on you. Uh, prayer is what binds it about you. Prayer is what holds it fast. And so uh, w- without prayer, uh, you know, uh, they're useless. And so don't forget verse 18. Okay, let's look at some of these. The girdle of truth, that holds all the armor together. The breastplate of righteousness. The feet shod with the gospel of peace. The shield of faith, Satan is powerless against our faith, that we may quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. They said back in the Bible days that a lot of these shields were made out of leather on the outside and they would soak them in water. And of course the enemy back then would shoot these flaming arrows. And of course when it would hit the, uh, the, those wooden shields with that soaked leather that they would uh, quench. And that's what he's talking about here. And then uh, the helmet of salvation and then the sword of the spirit, the only offensive weapon uh, in the armor is the sword. And that's the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Now, notice uh, this next saying in your book. This is from Dr. Sexton. Uh, this is a powerful statement. As Christians, we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory because we already have that in Christ. So remember that. That's a powerful statement. Dr. Sexton made that statement that we don't fight for victory in the Christian life. We already have it. We fight from victory. Uh, we sing the song, Stand Up for Jesus, from victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. And so we're fighting from victory. So remember that uh, as we study. And can you imagine, you know, Paul spent a lot of time next to the Roman soldiers. He was chained to them about half of his uh, ministry, uh, chained to a Roman soldier. And so can you, uh, as he was writing this, maybe the Holy Spirit woke him up one night and uh, perhaps, I, I, now this is not in the Bible, I'm just saying, perhaps, uh, you know, he's looking over at this soldier and the soldier's probably half awake and, 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 and the Lord begins to talk to him about the breastplate and the helmet and the feet shod and, and, uh, and maybe that's what Paul is doing uh, because he's writing this from Rome, from prison from house arrest and so uh, and so no matter uh, Paul spent a lot of time next to the Roman soldiers so this he's using this practical application talking about teaching Jesus used common ordinary things to teach the people spiritual applications that's what Paul's doing uh, you know we're in a spiritual battle but anyway let's look at Christ in the book the last slide Christ in the book he's the head of the church we read that uh, and, and uh, just read it again chapter 1 verse 22 And he hath put all things under his feet, that's Christ, and gave him, that's Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church. And then in uh, chapter 5, 23, we read that as well, uh, that says that uh, he is, uh, uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and the Savior of the body. And so he's the head of the church. In chapter 2, verse 20, we read, he's the chief cornerstone and and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, being the chief cornerstone. And then, of course, 525, he's the bridegroom who loves his church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so Christ uh, in the books. Our union enriches with Christ. So that concludes our uh, our uh, third semester, uh, School of the Bible, New Testament Survey 1. And so next week, we're still going to have School of the Bible. We're just not going to have a, a, a New Testament class. We'll have your other two classes. So uh, if you'll just take about a five-minute break, Pastor Mills will be here uh, with his message on the Christian home for week 11.
right, well, welcome back uh, to the second class this evening in our School of the Bible and uh, week 11, and we are studying on the Christian home, and uh, my, how important it is uh, this day and time to have a Christian home. I'm afraid they're getting few and far between, and but how important it is. If we're going to have success in this life, I think the Bible makes it very clear that it needs to be centered around uh, the Word of God. So tonight... Uh, we're going to talk about seizing the golden moments in life. Uh, I believe it was uh, James. Uh, James that said, life is like a vapor. It appeared for a little moment and then it's gone. Before you know it, time has gone. Uh, we put off things and we say we'll do this and we'll do this later or we'll do this uh, later on. And the next thing you know, later on it's done come and gone. And we have, we have not done what we needed to do and time has left us. And it has left a gap. So we need to seize the precious moments, the golden moments in our life. Children will one day not be children. And I have learned from my own that that doesn't take long. Next thing you know, they grow up and they're out doing their own thing and making their own decisions. How important it is at the time we have them uh, to teach them and train them in the way that God has instructed us uh, to do that. And so... Uh, the opportunities we have to train them and teach them about the things of God will pass very quickly. This is why we need to seize these moments in our life. And God gives us these moments and He expects us to use them. Now we're going to be in Deuteronomy chapter 6 tonight in your Bible. Matter of fact, we're going to look at the first 12 verses. We're going to read every one of these verses. But I want you to see what they're saying. In the first six verses, God gives instructions to Israel. He gives instructions to Israel. There's two things he tells them here. Uh, that's one, to love God and to obey God and uh, uh, to serve God and be faithful to God. And then in beginning of verse 7, he begins then to command uh, the, the home and the children uh, and what we should do in the home, how we should set an example in our home to the children. And we're going to look at those things, particularly that uh, verse number 7 talks about uh, tonight. So, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to read every one of these verses first. Then we're going to come back and look at them separately. So let's look at the Word of God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, reading the first 12 verses tonight. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments with the Lord, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it. Now he's speaking to Israel here. Thou, that thou mayest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's sons, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily as the Lord God of your fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. So what do we have here? Let's stop right there for a minute. What do we have here? We have the command of Moses uh, from God to the children of God to love God and to fear God, to make something out of God. Uh, to, uh, and by, by the way, verse 5 tells them how to do that. You do it with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. You could say do it with all you've got. We ought to make something out of God. Our children ought to see us making something out of God. Uh, people around us ought to see something being made out of God because God did something for us and what God did for us deserves us to brag on God uh, just a little bit. And so uh, we're to hear the Lord and to obey God that we might increase. The promises are there. God tells them if you want to do good and you want to, you want to progress, then you, you, God needs to be in His place. And so He's uh, directing this to Israel. Now, He begins now to switch the gears to begin to talk about their home. In verse 7 uh, through verse uh, 12, he'll give some instructions here uh, in the home. Uh, notice what it says in verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, 
and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. The guiding, what should guide us? The things of God. It should ever be before us, should ever be on our mind. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. We're to ever keep the word of God fresh and keep it in our minds. Uh, we do that by study of the word of God. We do that by hearing the preaching of God's word. We do that by attending Bible study. Uh, you're not going to get anything to help you off the news. You're not going to get anything to help you off of uh, uh, the, the crooked bunch talking on television. Well, you're going to get something that will help you and your family on right smack dab in the word of God. Now, we continue in verse uh, number 9. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates everywhere the word of God ought to be welcomed. Everywhere the word of God ought to be, uh, they ought to see it, they ought to hear it, they ought to know it. Our children, you know, uh, I'm going to stop here and, and throw in my own testimony. As a child growing up in my mom and dad's home, I wasn't asked if I wanted to go to church. I was told what time I better be in the car. Amen. I was, there's church time and, and there's, there's uh, play practice or there's Sunday school or the children are having a meeting. Uh, my, mom, my mom and dad never asked me, uh, do you want to go to the youth meeting tonight? They said, you be ready by this time you're going. You see, here's the problem today is mom and dad are, are letting the children decide what they do and don't do. And thus we have the problems we have. And I know that's not popular preaching, not popular teaching, but it's a fact. You know, how are we ever going to teach our children respect when we turn them loose like animals? You see, we have got to be the mom and dad <laughs> and say, it's church time. We've got to go to church. And this is where they learn. We don't go to church to punish our children. We go to church to help our children. One of these days, they're going to leave the nest and they're going to remember what was taught to them uh, in the home and in the church. Uh, verse 10, And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou sh shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. We need to remember that all the things we have, including our children, and we talked about this in previous lessons, including our children, including our blessings of our home, all came from God, came from the blessing of God. So we need not forget that. If we don't watch, we will forget where God's blessing comes. When the right things are placed in childhood, in the formative years of a child's life, in the growing up years of their life, Little boys and girls will grow up uh, to be good, godly friends, fathers, mothers, uh, examples. Uh, and that's what we need today. We desperately need uh, children bought of right today. Uh, they're not going to be around for, with us forever. And the moments we have to train are very precious. And that's why we need to seize these precious golden moments. Now, the rest of the class, we want to talk about the four things that's mentioned in verse number 7. And uh, verse number 7, let's read it again. And when thou, and, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So we'll talk about these four things. We're instructed here now how to conduct our Christian home from the Word of God. And to put the word of God in it. So number one, it says, when thou sittest in thine house. What does that mean? Well, when we're sitting around the house of the evening, or sitting around the house of a day, what are we doing? You know, most homes today, the TV's on, which I'm not against TV. I don't watch it much. I have to watch, her, so I have to watch stuff from back in the old days because they ain't fit to watch today. Amen. Uh, I ain't found anything fit to watch. They were showing today. I go back into Walton's days and Little House of the Prairie days and Andy Griffith. I watch some of that sometimes. But uh, yeah, that's not, not fit to watch. Uh, we ought to throw that thing over the hills, what we ought to do. But nonetheless, uh, you know, there is news on there and weather. And you do better to watch the weather than the news. It's more truth than the news is. But anyway, uh, 
But however, when thou sittest in thine house, when you sit around the house, today gadgets and uh, internet and cell phones occupy everybody's time. Facebook occupies everybody's time. There's not a lot of communication in the house. Uh, but, but when we sit us in thine house, what are we doing? What are we teaching? Uh, it is precious to have everyone. Uh, uh, you know, even, even today, it's hard press for a family to sit down and eat a meal together. I understand that. I understand that, you know, this one's working and that one's working and, and this one's here. I know with our house now, with uh, school coming and work here and work there, very seldom are we all home at the same time. And it's hard to do that. But, but you know, they've grown up. Now, it used to be when they were little, you know, we could gather around certain times. And so when thou sittest in thine house, as you have the opportunity, sit around the table and talk. Turn the TV off and talk. Uh, you know, share something, help something. Uh, you know, it's a precious to have the children at home and, uh, and to, to hear them and to talk with them. I'll never forget something my mother said. She's dead. She's, she's in heaven now. But I was a fussing one day uh, about the, you know, the house being noisy and the house being messy. And, and I said, you know, uh, it's just always a constant ruckus. She said, well, one of these days it'll be too quiet. And that's a lot of truth in that. I mean, uh, many folks can tell you that. Uh, one of these days you'll wish you had the mess to clean up. And one of these days you wish you had the noise to aggravate you. Uh, because that's what happens. When the, you need to seize the opportunities you have while we're sitting around the house. Hurry is the scurry of the family today. We're in a hurry. Every one of us will look back someday with regret that we did not seize the golden moments uh, we had together in the homes. We need to seize the golden moments God gives us, the opportunities God gives us to teach and to lead. Second of all, you find in verse 7, uh, it says, and, uh, uh, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk with them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way. Now, the, uh, this particular expression has to do with our responsibilities, has to do with things we have to do. Now, there is things we have to do. We have to go to school. You know, we have to, we, kids have to go to school, uh, and we need to teach them that school is a good place, uh, and that, that's part of life, part of responsibility we have to do. We have to go to work. It's important that we teach our children uh, the responsibility that biblically we are to work. That's what the Bible says. Amen. Biblically, we are to get out of, and, and uh, do the best we can to do our part. We are to pay our taxes. We don't like it. Uh, but it's, it's a responsibility we've been given. It's, it's what God has told us to do. It's an example to our children. You know what's wrong with our young people today? They didn't have no example. And you got these uh, uh, deserving bunch that's sitting at home, want somebody else to take care of them. You see, they, they didn't have an example. To get out and make the baby do the best you can, you know, circumstances happen, things do happen. But at the same time, we're to teach our children when thou walkest in the way, what is right, what is good, what is proper. You do this because it's right. You do this because it's your responsibility, and you do it. You follow the rules. You, you obey the law. If you don't obey the law, what happens? You end up in jail, or you end up with a fine, you know, and the children need to know what it is to obey the law. Uh, you know, I remember growing up and, and going to grandma's and we'd bake cookies and well, that's good. I like all that, you know. Uh, but uh, those are fun times. But there's, there's times, and by the way, it's, it's good to teach the children how to cook in the kitchen, how to work in the yard. Uh, they don't like it, you know. Mine doesn't like mowing the grass, but it's, it's a have to, got to do thing. Amen. And it's responsibility. I get, we get out, I get out there and help him, and we get her done, and it's, it's, it makes for a good opportunity. And what, that's, I, I think that's what the Scripture means. When we walk in the way, are we doing what's right? Are we showing the example to our children? Are we taking them down the road that is correct so they can grow up and be responsible human beings, so they can take care of business like they're supposed to, so they can uh, uh, be an example to their children one of these days. That's what, that's what he said back in verse 2, that thou mayest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, that thou, that thou and thy son and thy son's sons, well, that's the whole family. That takes it all the way down through the grandchildren. They'll have an example to follow. Thirdly, tonight, he says this in verse 7 
uh, when thou walk, uh, when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down. What does that mean? That means when it comes to bedtime. When it comes time, you're at the close of the day. You know, have we left a good example? And then when it's time to go to bed, do we go to bed in peace? You see, we don't have to be a war zone trying to get somebody in bed. Uh, it ought to be a peaceful time. Uh, sleep is a beautiful thing. Sleep is a wonderful thing. I like sleep. Yeah, and we need sleep. And so we need to be an example. You know, don't stay up all night hanging out. Uh, it's not a good example. Go to bed. Go to bed, get some sleep. And uh, uh, there should be a calm in the house. It should be enough calm in the house for people to go to sleep. You know, you'd be surprised how many children are afraid to go to sleep in their own house because the house is a war zone. Because they don't know where daddy is. They don't know what kind of shape daddy's going to come in the door be in. You see, that's not an example. That's not a peaceful place. Uh, that, you know, uh, and we, sh we shouldn't have that kind of home. Uh, you know, relax, relax. I like, to, I like to relax. I like to read a little bit before I go to bed and uh, then it gets your mind clear and you're able to rest and sleep and uh, have good rest. Matter of fact, uh, in your Bible, turn over to Psalm, book of Psalm, chapter number four. One verse here, and that's verse number eight. Psalm chapter four, verse number eight. Bible says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. There is peace in God. There is peace, there's safety in God. When God's in the house, there's peace and there's safety. People feel good. They feel safe. They feel loved. They feel wanted. Now, there has to be discipline. I understand that. God's given us, given us responsibility to discipline our family, to discipline our children. There has to be that, but it can be done in love as well, uh, as God would have us to do. And finally, the last thing he deals with in this verse is when thou, and when thou risest, uh, risest up, uh, when thou get up of a morning, starting the day, starting the day out right. Uh, I like to get up a little early before everybody else. That's a, that's a quiet time. Everybody's asleep. Everybody's resting. And it's a quiet time. And get the Word of God down and uh, good old 8 o'clock coffee. And uh, I sit there. Read the Word of God. It's a peaceful time. When they'll rise us up, you'll see. Uh, having our attitude. By the way, that starts the day off right. How do we start our day off? We were started in God, in the Word of God, in prayer, asking God to bless our day. I found out that when I start out that day that way, it goes so much better than when I just uh, jump out of bed and get ready and try to get scurry and get out the door in a hurry. Everything's a mess and the whole day's a mess. Start off in peace, start off in the Word of God, and the day will go so much better. Children should be greeted pleasantly every evening, uh, Make preparations, uh, be ready for the day, have the plans all set, and uh, they go so much better. Time is quickly passing on, and before you know it, time has left us. Job said in Job 14, verse 1, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble, full of trouble. Before you know it, it comes and it's gone, and, and we have to look back and see that we missed a lot of opportunities because we occupied our time somewhere else or because we were too busy and, uh, and we put off what we should have done then. One of the, one of the biggest failures, I think, of, of uh, people is uh, putting things off uh, too, too long. And uh, if we're going to steal in our children's lives we just must start early. I think of a lot of young people in the Bible. Matter of fact, I got chapel tomorrow at school. I'm going to talk about some young men and women in the Bible who did great things. You know, you think of uh, Joseph, and you think of David, and you think of the three Hebrew Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I'm going to dwell a whole lot on the little lad, the little lad that brought the uh, five loaves and two fishes. 
You know, well, what, what are, we, are we missing opportunities with our children? For them to serve God, need to teach them to do so. Seize the golden moments of life. And I, you'll find out that your children may not uh, be the perfect children. I guarantee they won't be the perfect children. They'll make mistakes. They'll make bad choices. But Proverbs tells us that if we'll train them up in the way they should go, when they're old, they will not depart from it. They will not forget. They'll remember what is right if they're taught what is right. All right. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Pastor Mays will be back just in a moment. Welcome back uh, for our final class of the night, Lesson 11 on teaching God's Word, okay? So we're uh, teaching the Bible, and so uh, take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter number 8, we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. Tonight, uh, we're going to, uh, excuse me, tonight we're going to talk about teaching teenagers, all right? Uh, one of the greatest challenges, no, I'm just kidding, uh, it, it's an amazing thing, uh, I love my teenagers, uh, and so uh, we talked last week about teaching the little guys, and uh, so this week we're going to learn a little bit about teaching teenagers. And so uh, whether you're in a Sunday school class or not, uh, teaching the Bible applies to every avenue of life, parenting, grandparenting, whatever, uh, uh, wherever we go. We have that responsibility. So you need to know how to do these things and need to know about it because uh, the teacher needs to know their students, right, if we're going to reach them uh, and be effective. So Proverbs chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, Unto you, old men... I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. So this is wisdom speaking. O oh, ye simple, understand wisdom, and ye fools, be ye of an understanding heart. So in Proverbs 8, 4, and 5, we learn that God speaks not only to adults, but also to young people. And so does God speak to young people? Absolutely. Of all, all different kinds, all different ages, uh, uh, God's the creator. He knows, he's the one who created them. He knows how to speak to them. He knows how to get them to rejoice and praise God, don't he, Joe? He knows how to do it, don't he, buddy? So in the book of Proverbs, there are four main characters. Now, notice this in the book of Proverbs, four main characters. And we did, we did a study with our teenagers about it. Well, see, maybe it's been two years ago now. Time goes away from me. Uh, our last group of teenagers just graduated. We went through the book of Proverbs there about a year. So there's four main characters, the wise man, which is the challenge, by the way, uh, the word wisdom in Proverbs means to be skillful. And so we ought to be skillful Christians, wise Christians. So there's the wise man, 
And then here's your blanks. There's the simple man, the simple man, the foolish man, so the simple and the foolish, there's your blanks, and the scorner. So uh, the primary four characteristics you find, the wise man, the simple man, the foolish man, and the scorner. Most teenagers identify with one of the middle two categories, okay? And so they need teaching of God's Word in order to obtain wisdom to make right decisions in life. And so uh, the, the simple means those that don't have the understanding. So, uh, you know, I tell the teenagers uh, that, that right now in your teenage years, uh, you know, of course, the group I got now, they're, they're mostly 13, 14, some of them 15. But I told them, I said, the next five years, you're going to be making some of the greatest decisions that you'll ever make in your life. Where are you going to go to school? What job you're going to have? Who are you going to marry? I mean, those are life-changing decisions, and you're just now coming out of your teenage years. So you need to be in God's Word to be prepared for that. And so uh, most fall into that category, and then uh, we do have some that falls into the foolish category. They get caught up in the things of the world and the things uh, that the devil has to offer, the world has to offer, and they follow the path of a fool. Okay, so they fall in those categories. Number one, things to remember about teenagers when you're teaching them. Now, remember, we read a few weeks ago, John 2, 24 and 25. Remember, the Bible says Jesus uh, uh, knew what was in man. And so it, look what it says. If We know people by knowing God. Let's just look at that, John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. How do we know people? How can we learn people? How can we teach to teenagers? Uh, you know, that was one of my greatest obstacles when I was asked to come here. I said, I don't know how to connect with teenagers. I'm an old, ugly, bald-headed guy. And I can teach adults and uh, put them to sleep, but I don't know how to connect with teenagers. And so uh, how do we learn how to do that? Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. I've prayed that many days. But here's how, verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and needed not any should testify them for he knew what was in man. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, I, I don't know how to connect with teenagers, but God does. And, and if I allow God to speak through me, if I allow God to give me the messages that somebody in that class needs, I found out that God does the work. Remember, we're in a spiritual work here. It's not about how great of a teacher I am and what I can do. It's just about me being a yielded vessel as a teacher, sharing the Word of God with them with a loving heart. God does the work of their life. That's the amazing thing, to watch step back and, and, and to take your hands off and to step back and watch them taking those steps of faith for themselves. Uh, I, I've heard so many testimonies here recently, uh, especially this last group of teenagers left. Uh, they're out in college, many of them right now, and, and I've heard several reports of them taking a stand, some of them in secular school, some of them, uh, you know, in, in other places in life, taking a stand for the Lord, and that does my heart well to know that they're out on their own. They're, they're, they're spreading their wings. And so here's what we need to know. If we're going to connect with them, we've got to know the Lord. And then here's some physical characteristics. Uh, number one, of course, a lot of this is common sense. Uh, growing quickly and their bodies are maturing into adulthood. And so they're not adults yet. They think they are, uh, but they're not, they're not adults yet. So they're still maturing. Uh, you know, I like to quote this fact to him. It's a proven fact that a teenager's brain is not fully developed yet. And so I, I like to pick on him about that. I mean, it's just scientific fact. Look it up. Uh, uh, I could say what Joe Arthur said. Joe Arthur said, you know, teenagers, they go to bed uh, one night and the next morning they wake up dumb or whatever, you know, so that's just the way they are, right? So they're, make, they're, they're learning things. They're experiencing life. So they, they are. Uh, think back when you was a teenager. Some of us adults are laughing. How many times do you mess up? You know, uh, how, many, how many times you cut yourself, learn how to shave, and all those things. So it, it, took, it took a lot of learning. So they're maturing, they're growing, and then sometimes they're filled with boundless energy. Okay, so sometimes they have all the energy of the world, and they're bouncing off the walls. I mean, you can't keep them sitting in the seat. I, I've got some of them, they'll sit down for two seconds, and then they they got to be bouncing around the room. And, they, and, and man, it just drives me crazy. They're just all over the place. Uh, and, and, but then at other times... They have very little energy at all. So it's a roller coaster. They're going through a roller coaster physically in their bodies, a roller coaster of emotions. So as a teacher, you've got to learn to deal with that. 
Now, I'll be honest with you, I've had to learn a lot about dealing with young people and teenagers, uh, you know, and, and I found out real quick uh, that dealing with them the way they dealt with me in boot camp doesn't work very good, okay? So you've got to get down on their level, uh, and so they're not ready for that yet. You're just uh, adding fuel to the fire, and you're making your problem worse. You know, a lot of people want to get in their face and put their finger down and start, yeah, that don't work very good, okay? Uh, but you've got to do it in a, a wise heart, a loving heart, deal with problems after the fact, just calm the situation, put out the fire, and then go back and reconstruct it later. That's the best way to do it. Uh, but they have, sometimes they have all kind of energy. Sometimes uh, they're almost like zombies, you know, uh, pulling the hoods up over the head, you know, just, they, they do all that. All right, that's just part of what they do. Social characteristics, all right, they're trying to become more and more independent of adults, okay? So they don't, they don't like a lot of adult interaction, uh, but they have to have that. They have to have some supervision, but they're trying to become independent of that. That's your blank there. Number two, they're self-conscious and concerned about outward appearance. Man, they, uh, you know, of course, you can look at me. I, I don't care much about that anymore, but uh, they are. They're concerned about what they look like. And, and you go, uh, you see the, the boys in front of the mirror, you know, and they're, uh, they're, they're fixing every hair, you know. And, uh, and co of course, I have uh, three daughters, and uh, they spend half their life in the restroom getting ready, you know. So, uh, anyway, I love you guys. Uh, but, anyway, I'm just saying they're worried about their outward appearances. Number three. Are y'all getting this? Am I going too fast? Okay. Number three, they want to be accepted by peers, and they usually run in cliques. So, uh, uh, man, uh, I, I've seen that. You come down here, and uh, I remember uh, when I come back here in 2015, down in that youth house down there, I remember nights that we had 40 teen, not, not kids, 40 teenagers in that room down there. And, and, and this group's over here, and that group's over there, and this group's in the back. And so they, they all stick in their little cliques. But what I've tried, I, I've tried, I've asked God to help me with this. I try to bring them together and, and intermingle them and try to uh, set them together. And, you know, and, and I, I, I've tried to break down those barriers. I don't even like to use the term uh, like bus kids or thing. I don't like to say it because they're all kids. They're God's kids, okay? And so uh, 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 what kind of vehicle they come to church in doesn't define who they are. Amen? God loves them. Jesus died for them. And so uh, we need to bring them together. But by nature, they like to travel in their friend. You know, they're, they're comfortable. That's their comfort group. They'll be, you know, some teenagers that they won't even speak to nobody. You, you, you can't even get a crowbar to pry a word out of their mouth. But when they get around the right people that they're comfortable with and once they warm up to you, man, you, you can't keep them quiet. You know, you, you can't uh, you, know, uh, you know, I've had them say, man, they never make a sound. I was like, well, you just don't know them that good yet, okay? Once you get around them. So that's who they are. That's what they're doing. I know I'm getting off track. Number four, they're trying to find their place in society. And so, uh, and, and by the way, uh, this is what the world knows and this is why the devil's attacking in the, especially the public school system now with evolution and all this transgender garbage and stuff. They're promoting that at this age. The world knows that, the devil knows that, that they're very impressionable and, and, and that they're trying to find a place in society. They're trying to find a group. Uh, that welcomes them, and you could just be whatever you want to be. We'll accept you. We'll love you. Well, those bunch of Christians that preach against sin uh, and all that, they're hateful people. They're hate mongers. But you just come and just do anything you want, and, and that's what they're looking for. They're looking for somewhere to fit in. And it's, and it's really sad, and I'm probably getting off topic a lot here tonight, but, uh, but I've learned a lot the last few years. Uh, you know, I, I'm thinking of uh, uh, some, some kids that I knew when I, I first got here. And man, they they uh, uh, they're not around now, but they they didn't have very good home life, and uh, and I mean I could just tell you stories would break your heart, but. You know, they would go from one week to the next. You know, one. Uh, you know, I was kind of concerned there at first because, again, I was. I'm still learning. I I don't know how to be a youth pastor yet. I'm still learning how to do that. Uh, but uh, working on it. But you know, uh, one one week uh, th this little girl she wanted to be a witch. The next week she was identifying with the homosexual crowd. The next week, you know, I'm I'm like all over the place. But you know what she's doing? She's trying to find. She's trying to be in a group that accepts her, and it'll break your heart. It really will. And, and you try to reach them with the Lord and tell them that Jesus, and, and, and if my kids hear nothing else from me week after week, every teenager that's been under my voice, I've tried to preach them that God has a purpose for your life, that Jesus loves you. You're not an accident. Christ created you for a reason, to glorify Him. So they're trying to find their place, and they need to know that there's purpose and meaning to life, but that's only found in Christ. Number five, looking, they're looking for hero, heroes and role models to follow. They're very impressionable. And again, Hollywood knows this. The devil knows this. That's why the pop culture... You know these pop singers? You know what age group they're targeting now? 
It's not 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds, it's 9 and 10 year olds, 8 and 9 year olds. And God forbid the parents that allow their kids to listen to that garbage. They're trying to steal your kids right out from under your nose. And if you're allowing them to listen to that garbage and music, then you, you, you're, you're helping the devil out. And uh, I'll just say that, but God forbid. And uh, may you get on your knees and ask God to forgive you and help you allowing that garbage in your home. They're trying to steal your kids. And that's exactly what they're doing. These, these singers like uh, Katy Perry and all these others, I, I could go on and on. But they, 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 they've admitted it. They said, we're not after the 16, 17-year-old. We're, we're after the 9 and 10-year-old preteen kids because they're so impressionable. And, and, and if you're, I'll just say it like this, if you're dumb enough to allow them to listen to it, then uh, expect to reap the whirlwind, as the Bible says. Amen? Let her see mental characteristics, okay? Uh, I, I, I want to make some teenager jokes here. There's not very many. Uh, mental, but number one, they're interested in adventure and discovery, you know. And uh, here's where I thought I'd have a big t- hard time. You know, uh, these kids love to play games and ball. Of course, look at me. I'm not, uh, I'm not designed to play ball and, and do all those things. I, I play, and usually about three days later, Jenny's laughing at me because I'm, I'm walking around the house. My back's out with me, and uh, you know, and I can't hardly walk. But I, I try to play with them and uh, have a good time. But they look for that. They like adventure. They like to go to the theme parks and ride the scariest roller coasters. And, and, and I, I say, I'll hold your coats. And, 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 and I, I, they got tickled at me a few years ago. We went to Dollywood. And uh, he's like, come on, Pastor JP, we're going to ride the eagle. I said, look. And I didn't know this guy was behind me. He wasn't with us, was listening. I said, I've done determined two things in my life. Number one, I don't see the need in it. I don't think it's necessary. And number two, I don't want to die that way. And this guy behind me started dying laughing. He was like, Pastor JP, come on, let's go. I said, no, I'll hold your coach and y'all, I'll watch you ride it, okay? But they love that kind of stuff. They love to be scared, discovering things. But see, what we're talking about, you can use this to your advantage uh, to do things. Make things interesting for them. Interested in argument and debate. And even they even question authority. And so uh, uh, they, they like to question. And so they're getting to that stage. They're able to think for themselves. You know, when they're five and six year old, you know, they're just, you know, uh, you, you know, you just give them a lollipop and tell them something, they'll believe anybody, right? And so, uh, uh, by the way, candy's a good way to bribe them to uh, uh, to learn things, okay? And I use that as an incentive to learn. And so you can get them to pay attention real quick. You hold up a candy bar, uh, they're all talking. You, you get their attention real quick. I, I found out that works. But with the teenagers, that, they still like candy, but that doesn't work a lot. They're, they want to ask questions, which is a good thing. And as a teacher, don't, I mean, you know, uh, we don't allow the kids to be rebellious, but if they want to ask questions, they're asking because they don't know. They're, remember, they're trying to find their place. They're asking, you know, uh, uh, is Christianity real? Is God real? How can you prove God? You know, so th- they'll ask you some things that will take you off your guard sometimes, but we need to be ready, as pa- Peter said, to give an answer. So they, th- sometimes they question authority. Okay, they don't, they, but see, again, they don't have the full understanding and experience of life, you know. Uh, you know, and I tell them all the time, I say, you're young and uh, you got your whole life ahead of you, but you need to understand that mom and dad and, and uh, people God's put in your life, pastors and teachers, you know, we got a few more miles on us than you do, and uh, we got a little bit of thing that you don't have. It's called experience, and so you can learn a lot from experience, you know. It's like that commercial, uh, you can learn a lot from a dummy, you know. So, so uh, I've been there, so don't, don't make the dumb mistakes I've made. Number three, capable of reasoning and thinking things through logically. You know, uh, 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 sometimes the, 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 the answer, because I said so, doesn't work real good with teenagers, okay? You've got to be able to explain, you know, why you're doing you know, and, and I, I've tried to do this, uh, you know, uh, even correcting my own kids and things that uh, you go back and, and, and you explain that this is why that, that I'm asking you not to do this. This is why we don't listen to this music. This is why we don't go to these places. You know, not just, uh, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of men especially, they just want to be that drill instructor or authority figure. I said so. I don't have to tell you anything. You're just going to do it because I say so. That, that, that doesn't work very well. I'm just going to be honest, especially with teenagers, and I found out dealing with problems uh, with kids. Uh, when we've had 70 and 80 kids here, and I've dealt with everything from fights to, uh, you know, uh, ju- uh, just a plethora of uh, uh, suicide issues. I mean, I've, I could just tell you stories after stories. But you've got to be able to understand uh, and, and, and to, to, to be able to explain to them why you're doing what you do, okay? And so uh, reason with them. Don't yell at them. Uh, let them know this is why we have rules and explain that to them. And, and their understanding, they, they, they learn more than you think they do. Number four, they can be very creative 
and idealistic. And so let them share their thoughts and ideas. And, and, and I, I did that before when I first got here, and, and I didn't know nothing about youth pastoring. I, I did like an anonymous survey, uh, and, and I, I put out, uh, what are some of the things you guys, activities you want to be like to be involved in? Uh, I, I put some things like, uh, what are some questions? And, and I said, I don't want you to put your name on it. I just want you to turn this in, and, and I got a lot of good feedback. You know, what are some questions you have about the Bible? What are some issues you're having in life? Don't put your name on it, but just, and, and they give a lot of feedback. <laughs> I remember one, and, 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 I, and I, even though they didn't put their name on, I kind of figured out uh, who it was, and, I, and, I, and, and I'll, I'll tell Pastor later who it was, but uh, 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 one of, it was about one of the activities of the games, it, uh, and, and, and the young lady had, uh, put on her thing, and she later told me, she said, just play basketball. The boys love basketball. I said, okay, so that helped me out. So if I give them basketball time, uh, they, they were good to go. Okay, so she helped me out there really a lot. But they're creative. They have a lot. Man, these kids, they have a lot of great ideas. So let them use that. Uh, and I, I'm thankful for the kids up here singing and stuff. We have a lot of talent in this church, but you know, you have to give them an opportunity. Some of them are just waiting for you to ask them. You know, we're not mind readers, but sometimes you just they're just waiting for you to ask them. And, uh, and uh, they just want to be involved, and they're very creative. They have a strong sense of humor, but yet they can be moody, okay? And so you got to learn to be able to deal with that. i got to move on. Okay, and so, uh, so they have a good sense of humor. You can kid around with them a lot, but uh, uh, don't be dry fuddy-duddy. But uh, they're moody sometimes, so you just got to be able to adapt to that. You just got to understand, okay, I'm dealing with teenagers. This is what's going to happen. And if you know that, it's not going to take you off guard. Letter D, here's some spiritual characteristics they have. They desire a practical personal faith in God. And this is where I've been so blessed here recently with, with some of these, these last few years and, and this year now, the, the young people that we have coming up in our teen group. Man, I, I look back there when I'm preaching, when Pastor Mills is preaching, when we go to these youth conferences, and they got their notebooks and they're taking notes. I mean, and nobody has made them do that. They're stepping out on their own. So they have a, they have a desire for a practical personal faith in God. And not all of them's going to be like that. You have to understand not everybody in the crowd's going to be at that level. But but you're you're reaching the ones you can. And you're teaching the ones you can. And I realize a lot of people ain't coming back to church right now, and I've accepted that. I'm just going to deal with who I have. If I got one or two or ten, I'm going to teach them. I'm going to I'm going to work with them. But they desire, and that's just such a wonderful thing that they desire to hear. They're hungry for God's word. They're taking notes. Nobody's making them do that. I've seen a few the other night. They're lifting their hands, worshiping God. I mean, that just blesses my soul to see that. Having, they have a vision for service, and they need to be needed to serve God. Everybody, I don't care who you are, in the body of Christ, God has something for you to do. Even the young people. If all you can do is just sit in a pew and praise God and say, then that's what God's created you to do. They're needed. They need the church needs that. God help a church that, that doesn't let their young people be involved, that doesn't encourage them to be in the service of God. They need to be needed. They don't understand that. They don't under, realize that. They don't know that. But the teenagers, they need that structure and discipline in life. They need to feel needed. They need to feel... That gives them a sense of purpose. That gives them a sense of accomplishment. They're looking at you, watching, and, and even these younger kids. Remember we talked about that? Like they'll do something. They'll, they'll see if, if you're noticing them coloring this page or, or if they learn this verse or they'll come up and say, Brother JP, I did this. They're looking for that encouragement from you. They need to be needed. So know that. They need to be needed. They have a vision for service, doing what they can. They have an increasing desire to help others. Man, I'm telling you, we, we did some projects and things, and uh, man, some of the kids, they just jump in. Some of them just sits back and watches, but a lot of them, our mission team, we went down to Florida last year, man, they, uh, we didn't have to, st I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I didn't raise my voice one time at that group of kids. They jumped in, Miss Linda told them what to do, and they were busy every day. I didn't even, they, they were just going, you didn't, they, they were looking for things to do, and so they want to do stuff. And so uh, many, uh, they may have, they may question Christianity or the Bible at times, okay? And, uh, you know, and, and not in a defiant way. It's okay to ask questions, okay? Now, you've got to watch that uh, uh, rebellious attitude where they're trying to defy everything. But even at that, you've got to be able to take them to the Bible and show them where they're wrong and correct them in love. Okay, I've got to move on. They can be, oh, man, look at this, number five. They can be emotional and devotional in their faith. And so if you're working with teenagers, just be equipped, be ready. Uh, you're going to deal with emotions. Man, you're talking about drama. Oh, my word. 
Uh, drama, drama, drama. Okay, boyfriend. Oh, uh, you know, uh, Bob broke up with me this week. I'm just so hard. You know, I mean, you're going to deal with all that. You know, uh, you know, uh, you know. Of course, uh, you know. Some of them's like, uh, uh, like Baskin Robbins. They're, they're trading uh, boyfriends out every week. Uh, you know, one week, uh, you know, strawberry. The next week, raspberry. I mean, so they got they got a different. So, but they're they're not emotional. And I I, I tell the teenagers, and, and of course, uh, the, the parents might let them do this. But uh, if I'm going to teach them, I'm going to teach them the Bible. I, I said, y'all not ready to be in a relationship yet. You're you're emotionally not ready. You're physically not ready. I, and I tell them all the time, they don't like it. But I said, here's two things you need to concentrate in your life right now. If you don't hear me, uh, this is what I'm going to say to you anyway. Number one, you need to put God first in your life. And number two, you need to focus on your education. Everything else will take place in time. You don't need to be worried about all the rest of that garbage in life. Put God first and get your education behind you. And then God will work all the rest of it. Amen. All right. So they can be emotional, but they can also be devotional, as we said. Uh, they desire to have a relationship with God, and I've seen them. You know, uh, we go to these camps and things, and, the, and I've seen some of these young kids get up in the mornings. They're just out reading their Bible, and they're with the Lord, and it's just a blessing. So they, they, they have a need for that. They love to do that. Number two, some truths that we should emphasize to the teenagers. All right, is everybody getting all these blanks so far? My allergies is killing my nose running. Uh, letter A, salvation. Of course, uh, that's your uh, first blank there. It's the most important. Get this statistic. Over 80% of Christians were saved before the age of 16. Over 80% of people that are saved are saved before the age of 16. And every year in life, that percentage goes way down. This may be the last opportunity for seed to fall on good ground. God wants to work in the teenagers' lives. And I'm seeing God work in teenagers around here these last few months, these last few weeks, and it's a blessing and, it's an, and I want to keep that fire going. I'm excited about our youth rally and uh, the things that are happening. But, but beyond the youth rally, I'm excited what God's going to continue to do. And so this is a great opportunity in their lives. And last week we went to that uh, youth rally. Man, God was working. 21 teenagers were saved in that place. An amazing thing. And we've been to some of the tent revivals. We've, uh, that one, I think we went to, uh, where was it, uh, down in Bristol, uh, it was almost 200 or 130 to 200 got saved that one night. Just kids coming forward. Just, they're, they're hungry for God. They need that. They're, they don't want to hear preaching. You know, we, we had a, uh, I heard from, uh, 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 through a third party, you know, uh, 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 another preacher was asking about our youth conference and say, well, uh, are, are y'all going to have breakout groups? Are y'all going to have audiovisual interactions with the kids? And I was like, no, we're just going to have preaching. Well, we believe that, uh, no, we just need to preach the gospel. God, the Holy Spirit will deal with them. We don't need to entertain them. We don't need a rock concert. We don't need a, 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 an NFL football player. We need somebody to preach the gospel to them. Somebody to love them, be real with them. That's the, that's the bottom line. If you cut me off right now, the bottom line dealing with teenagers, you've got to be real with them. Just be real. Meet them where they're at. Love them. Be kind to them. Be firm. You've got to be firm, but you be kind to them and love. Just meet them where they're at and be real with them. Salvation, that's the greatest need. Letter B, then soul nourishment. After salvation, soul nourishment. We must continually emphasize the importance of a devotional life and teach teenagers to walk with God. It's so important to get them started to this age in a devotional life with God. Number one, I like this, get the Bible into teens. Teach them solid Bible truths. Do you all have that, step one? Okay, get the Bible into teens at step one. Then look at step two. Get teens into the Bible. So you're teaching it, trying to put the Bible in them, but there has to come a point and a time in their life where they develop that for themselves and they get into God's Word themselves. That's what's going to change their lives. Okay, You're communicating truth, you're helping them, you're priding them, you're encouraging them, but hopefully at some point they're going to get where they do that on their own. And when they do that, then they experience God. You see, I can get up and tell them of the experiences that God has done in my life and how real that God is to me and how good that God has been to me. And that's, that's just passing truth. That's just passing information. But my desire and my goal is for them to know the God that I know, for them to have the relationship that I've had with Him, for them to be in those times to realize that God is real and God is good. That's why it's my philosophy to take them to every youth conference where God's Word's being preached, the right kind of singing, the right kind of environment is, because I know eventually if they get around God long enough, it's going to rub off on them. That's my desire, and the Holy Spirit can do way more with them than I can. So they need to come into that real relationship with God. They need soul nourishment. Let her see. Oh, boy. 
They need submission. Submission. Teens who are submitted to God will be submitted to every God-ordained authority in their life. When you're, deal- uh, when you're dealing with a rebellious teen, you're dealing with, with uh, you know, they have a problem with authority, but their greater problem is a problem with God. God's not first in their life. You, 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 can, you can conclude that right off the first of the bat without even having to know their life. When you have somebody that's bucking up on you and rebelling against authority and every authority figure in their life, they're rebelling against God first. That, that's the root of the problem. That's the root of the whole thing. They've got to get their lives right with God. And then God will take care of the rest in their life. But it, uh, su- submission, uh, submission God's will to God's will is the great battle in the Christian life and, and we as adults. You know, I've been teaching about Abraham. He's, uh, we're talking about faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And we talked this last week. I, I said uh, there's three steps in the Christian life. And I said the majority of Christians never get to step number two. The first step, God calls us to salvation. And everybody that's saved has made that first step of faith. And by the way, it's all by faith. The first step is salvation. The second step, which most Christians never get to, is the step of surrender. After salvation, the second step is the most important uh, step in your Christian life. The first step is the most important in your life, but the second most important is the place of surrender. When you come to that place, and this ain't just for teenagers. As a matter of fact, I might preach this. This ain't just for teenagers. This is for adults that we all come to that place where you say, Lord, I want what you want for my life. I'm giving you, I've trusted you with my soul, that salvation. Now I'm committing my life to you. I want to be what you created me to be. And it's sadly, many Christians never get to step number two. But I'm telling you what, when you get to that place, it's the happiest place of your life. When you, when you just allow God to work it in your life, you don't know. Abraham stepped out not knowing where he went. I, I stepped out in 2008. I didn't know I'd be a youth pastor. I didn't know I'd preach in jails. I didn't know I'd uh, go to juvenile detention centers. I didn't know I'd preach in nurse home, but God did. And God's led every step of the way. But you see, they need to come to that place of surrender. Then finally, once you know what God wants you to do, the third step is service. Just do what God's created you to do. Serve God the rest of your life. But anyway, they need submission in their life. But that's something that a lot of times you have to earn with them. You know, if you're Johnny Drill Sergeant, you know, you're not going to get very far with many of them. So you have to gain that respect. You have to earn it. But you have to be firm. You have to say, hey, look, guys, this is the rules. This is what we have. There's consequences. Now, here's where you get in trouble dealing with young people when you set all these rules, but you don't go by them. Say, all right, if you do this, then you're going to get in trouble. Well, that's where a lot of parents get in trouble. I'm telling you, for the 56th time, you know, it needs to be one time. You know, I had to say with my kids, I said, don't make me tell you twice. And they learn really quick that, that first time. Me And, you know, really, really after that, I had no, you know, I'm just speaking for my own kids, but even I've seen it as teenagers. If they know where you're at, this is the rules, and when we discipline them, hey, you broke the rules, here's the consequence, okay? All right, this is, a, I'm giving you a verbal warning, and me and pastors had many of these with these kids. We'll sit them out and say, hey, look, look, you're breaking the rules. We have rules for reasons. They do it again, okay? All right, you cross the line. Here's the first consequence. All right, and some of them's had to go on down the line to get to the, 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 the final severe thing, which is, you know, uh, you know, we ask them not to come back, which that's the last place we want to be, okay? So there's too many steps in between to help them. But they have to have that. And then letter D, separation. Teenagers need to learn separation. Teenagers must present themselves to God and allow Him to transform their lives rather than being conformed to the world. Now, this is something we can't do. We can teach them. We can be the example. The greatest thing they need is an example, somebody to follow. Okay, I can't make them do any, and I had to learn that as a preacher, even pastor and adults. I can't make people do anything. I had to learn that real quick. You know, I, I get discouraged, but I can't make, I can't change, I can't, I, I have a hard enough time with this one, much less 300 others, you know, so I can't change anybody. But let God work in their life. Be the example for them to follow. Be the example that they want to follow, okay? Be, be somebody uh, uh, that loves the Lord, they can see Christ in your life, and God will do the work. So they need to learn separation from the world. They need to be taught that. They don't know that. And we're living in a world where it's just the evil is trying to flood into their lives. And, and you, know, uh, you know, it's like when we uh, was on a submarine, the thing they taught us, you know, keep the water out. Uh, you know, because, you know, you're out there in a little tube and the whole ocean is trying to come in a little hole. You get one little hole and the whole ocean is trying to come in there. That's the life, the, that's the world these teenagers are growing up in. That, that the world and the devil and the influence of the world, it's trying to flood their lives. It's trying to overcome them. And so they, they, they have to maintain that. 
separation. And then letter E, service. We must challenge teens with Christ's command to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. The zeal and enthusiasm of our youth should be yielded to God's work. And so we need to teach them how to serve God. You know, uh, teach them how to get out here and work in the church. And, and we, we've tried to do that, especially with our mission team. We hold them, uh, uh, those uh, guys that want to do that, we reward them greatly, but they have to work for it. They have to serve in the church, you know. Of course, some of that's changed since COVID, but, uh, uh, but we're slow to get back. Where we make them sing in a choir. We make them, uh, you know, help with classes, help with Bible school. Do, be in service, getting involved in the church because, you know, after we're dead and gone, guess who's going to run the church? It's going to be them. All right, and then lastly, teaching God's Word to teenagers. Okay, the principles that must be followed, number one, be genuine. Just be real. Be genuine. Don't try to be like them. Be yourself. They're going to know real quick that, you know, that you don't, and the teenagers' uh, vernacular and their vocabulary, you don't know half what they're talking about. I mean, they laugh at you because you don't know what uh, 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 TikTok and ding a whatever, all these things you're following, you know, uh, uh, Snapshot, Snapchat. You know, my, my daughters, they're, they're probably laughing at me right now because I'm getting all that wrong. Uh, but but don't, don't try to be like them. That's where parents get in trouble. Don't try to be like them. Just be yourself. Be real. Be your friend. You know, and they're going to laugh at you. You're going to laugh at them. You have a good time. Number two, be enthusiastic. Man, look at this. I love this saying. The Bible is never boring, only the speaker is. Wow. The Bible's not boring, but we as a, a teacher can be, and God help us not to be. We need to be excited. How in the world, uh, if we're not excited about coming to church, if we're not excited about teaching the Bible, what do you think we're teaching then? You know, it, it, your, your kids, if you're not excited about coming to church, you think it's okay to miss uh, every other service and only come once a month, what are you teaching your kids? Now, you might not be verbally teaching them, but they're watching you more physically than they are verbally. You need to be enthusiastic. Letter B, the presentation of the teacher. Use a variety of methods. You know, and, and there's nothing wrong with these uh, visual aids and handouts and groups discussions, responsive reading, interaction, question and answer. I use that a lot. Role playing, I, I do that with them sometimes too. Audio, video. Case studies, problem solving, lecture, reviews, testimonies, or interview. You can use all those things, and we're not saying those are wrong. You know, but there's a time for preaching. You know, uh, you know, we're not here to entertain. You know, we're not running a we're not running a fitness center and entertain. We're not running a movie house. We're not running an entertainment center. We're we're, we're trying to teach people the Bible, teach young people, and preach the Bible. You know, but with the kids, you got to have activities. You got to do things with them, and so we understand that. I mean, you can use these different things. Number two, use repetition. The key is stating the same truth in different ways. In your teaching, attack from every angle. In your teaching, attack from every angle. So uh, uh, approach it from uh, different directions, the same truth. Number three, we're almost done, two more. Use illustration, instruct with principles, and illustrate with personalities. Use these Bible characters. Use other characters, especially the Bible. Teach a biblical truth, but then share an experience, personalities, people. Okay? Uh, in the Bible. Then number four, and we're done, emphasize the application. That's the bottom line. We want them to apply the Bible to their life. The bottom line is how does this apply to me? That's the whole goal of the Bible teacher. Relaying the truth in a way that makes it where they understand how they can apply it to their life. That's what we got to get to. Okay, I know we had a little bit, a little bit of a long lesson. Now next week, uh, uh, we're going to be back uh, for our last uh, uh, lesson of this semester. We'll have two classes next Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday's still on, right? I think so next Tuesday. And so uh, we're going to have our School of the Bible class. We thank you. I can't believe it's almost over. And uh, we hope you'll be found in the house of the Lord. This weekend's Easter weekend. We're excited about that. Good Friday communion service here Friday. Of course, our Bible study Wednesday. And uh, we're just looking forward to a good week in the Lord. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for all that you do. Thank you for this good School of the Bible, the lessons we've had. And God, help us to reach another generation for Jesus Christ and be the Christians you want us to be. For it's in Christ's name we pray. And amen. God bless you. Have a good evening.